Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar, The Science of Making Friends for Teens and Adults with ASD, the UCLA Peers Program. Today on the desk we have Dr. Elizabeth Logason, a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychology and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA. She also happens to be the founder and the director of the Peers Clinic. Now, for those of you who have not heard of the Pierce Clinic or the Pierce Program, it's an outpatient hospital-based program providing parent-assisted social skills training for adolescents and young adults with ASD. As we all know, deficits in social skills are considered one of the defining challenges among youth on the spectrum. Yet few evidence program, evidence-based programs exist, and we're lucky today because Dr. Logson literally wrote the book on the subject. Today on the desk, we're gonna, as we always do, we're going to have a lively discussion and we are going to be talking about tips on providing social coaching. We will provide concrete rules and steps of social behavior derived from the peers program. And if we do our job right, you're going to walk away with some easy to use strategies for young adults and teens that will help them make and more importantly, keep friends. Now, I know you're as excited to get down to it as I am, but before that, we always got some housekeeping matters, so I want to draw your attention to the console through which you're watching us today. Right now, you're seeing me come in live over the video and audio, and beside me is PowerPoint slides. They're going to be changing throughout the presentation, adding color to the discussion that's happening on the desk. Today, it's important to focus on those slides because we're adding a new level of interaction in, into this event. Some, from time to time, we're not just going to take your questions, we're going to be asking you questions and we're going to be looking for your answers. Those questions will show up on those slides. Now, throughout the presentation, as always, submit questions in the Ask a Question box directly below me and I will aspire to get you answers from Dr. Logason. And at the times where we're looking for your, your feedback, you too should submit that feedback through that mechanism and it'll show up here on my laptop. Finally, as always, we're going to be referencing some data, websites, and a bunch of topical information that's related to our presentation, which you can find in the resource section. And if you're having any issues with the technology, please go to the Help Center, where someone from our, or the Help button, someone from our team will be able to assist you. Now, with all that out of the way, let me welcome, from California, Dr. Logason. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's a lot cooler here, I'm sure, than when you when you left California. A little bit, yeah. a little bit. You've been in town for a couple of days. How's it been? A couple of days, yeah. Love it. Love Toronto. Spent a lot of time here. I'm excited to be back. Great. So um, let's start. I mean, the Pierce Clinic, the Pierce Program, it's mm -hmm. become very popular, very successful. Talk to me about why you started it and why you think it's so successful at this point. You know, we started to develop the Peers Program at UCLA about 10 years ago now. I can't believe it's yeah. been a whole decade. But back then in 2004, um, there were virtually no social skills programs for adolescents with autism. It's right. kind of shocking. In Los Angeles, we had no one to refer to. Yeah. Um, so we immediately saw that there was a huge service delivery gap, but also a research gap in that there were no evidence-based social skills programs for adolescents with autism. And that's that's really what led us to develop the peers intervention, and, and you're right, it's sort of taken off since then. There still isn't a lot of evidence-based programs out there, no. I understand, unfortunately. Um, let's get a baseline for our audience. Based on the data, what are the typical deficits associated, uh, social deficits associated with ASD? Mm -hmm. Right, well typically social communication skills tend to be an issue for okay. a lot of people with autism. So what that typically looks like um, are difficulty having conversations with people, um, being able to trade information back and forth. A lot of our, our kids tend to have very one-sided conversations and have a lot of difficulty knowing what to talk about. Topic initiation is a big issue and so conversational skills, big, big issue. Issue. Another issue um, would be so poor social awareness, sort of understanding um, social cues, picking up on those cues. Uh, poor social motivation as well. Social motivation? Social motivation. So not so much that they don't want to have friends and right. be social, but often don't know how to, don't okay. know how to make friends. So that's an issue. And then poor social cognition is also another one of those hallmark features in autism. And basically that's a technical term right. for just understanding the perspectives of others, being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So the topic is making friends, mm -hmm. and the book says the same thing. Why, um, why should friendship be a focus? 
Well, we know um, from, from years and years of research that just having a couple of close friends is really predictive of later adjustment in life and really also can buffer the impact of stressful life events. I mean, think about when you're having a bad day, you're stressed out, who do you go to? You turn to a friend or a family, family member. Um, we also know having a couple of close friends is correlated with things like independence, okay. self-esteem. You feel better about yourself. You're more independent if you have a couple of close friends. But on the reverse side of that, um, you're less likely to be depressed and anxious if you have a couple of close friends. So this is a different way to essentially address some of the mental health issues that a lot of our kids struggle with. So making friends, being a challenge, initiating that process comes with possible rejection. I imagine that's mm -hmm. a challenge when dealing with uh, children or young adults on the spectrum. Absolutely. Unfortunately, many, many of our kids actually experience peer rejection um, as a result of their poor social skills, unfortunately. And the problem is there's a lot of really negative consequences of this peer rejection. Um, mental health issues, again, come into play. So one of the strongest predictors of mental health problems like anxiety and depression is peer rejection. If you want to go into just a typical secondary school and look for the peer rejected kids, those are the ones that are probably more likely to be depressed and anxious later in life. So when you see these indicators like, mm -hmm. like that, is it always peer rejection that's the, the initiator? or? No, actually a lot of kids that present for social skills training, for example, yeah. many of them will be peer rejected. So these are the kids who are actively seeking out their peers, but they're actively getting pushed away. And they're often teased and bullied, and they might even have bad reputations with their peers. But there's this other group of kids that are described as more socially neglected. These are the kids who tend to be more socially isolated. Okay. They're often withdrawn. They're seen as shy. Yeah. Um, but really, they're not even trying to engage their peers. Mm -hmm. um, but they both equally struggle socially. Okay. So coming a little bit back to the program, when um, we talked off the top, the reason why you did it, right? Not a lot of evidence based, but talk to us a little bit more about the program in its entirety. Yeah, well, what makes Peers sort of unique from other social skills programs is that we actually include parents in the intervention. That's pretty revolutionary yeah. for some reason. Um, most social skills programs don't do that, but the reason that we include parents is because we know that parents often act as social coaches to their kids. Right. They're constantly giving advice. Yeah. Um, the problem is that we've discovered that it's not always the right advice. Sometimes we think we're giving good advice and maybe it's not so um, helpful. And so we want to teach parents to be good social coaches to their kids. The other reason we want to include parents is that, you know, this is a time-limited program. Right, would you say it's 14 weeks? It's a 14-week program right. for adolescents, 16 weeks for young adults. And, you know, that's not a lot of time right. in the grand scheme of things. We see the families for, you know, once a week for 90 minutes. Right. But parents are there the vast majority of the time. Right. And so we want to teach them to be social coaches in the way that we would be if we were there. Right. So going through the program, mm -hmm. what skills should we expect to, to pull from it? Well, we teach a number of skills. We Basically, this, the sessions are focused on uh, two main concepts. One is making and keeping friends, right. and the other is on handling peer rejection. So in terms of making and keeping friends, we focus on things like conversational skills, okay. really fundamental to adolescent and adult interaction socially. Um, from there, we get into things like electronic communication, choosing appropriate friends. We talk about humor, the you know, appropriate use of humor. Yep. Um, and then also things like peer entry and exiting, which is basically going up and starting conversations with people or entering conversations, assessing if you're accepted, exiting if you're not. Yeah. Um, and then things around you know, developing friendships like having get-togethers, um, being a good sport when you, you know, play games and sports. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the program, what can we expect? Is this classroom stuff? Is it like group? What, how, what should they expect from the program? So basically we teach the social skills in, in a couple of different formats. We have our parent assisted program that usually takes place in community based mental health settings. We okay. also have a school program. Um, it says there's a school curriculum for educators so that could also be taught in an educational environment but it's always a small group format. Okay. We typically like to have anywhere from seven to ten kids in a group. In, in classrooms it can be a little bit larger. Do you keep them all around the same age or does it matter? You know we like to keep them around the same age but you know at our, in our program at UC CLA, we have middle school and high school kids, so that can range all the way from 11 years old to 18 years old. Wow. As long as there's a couple of kids around the same age um, and they're all socially motivated, want to be there, it seems to work very nicely. Okay. So that's the first piece is the small group format, and they're not there to make friends with each other. They're there just to practice with each other. Right. So then from there, we have small um, didactic lessons each week, so we're teaching skills using lessons. Like a lecture. 
Like well, no, no, definitely classroom. not a lecture because that would be boring. Right. And that would not engage them. So it's using a Socratic method where we sort of um, we do role play demonstrations. We'll say, watch this, tell me what I'm doing wrong. We get very interactive. Right. But the idea is that there are lessons with concrete rules and steps of social behavior. A lot of people think that social skills um, are very abstract. You know, it's just sort of like what you do naturally. Yeah, things you, you learn it based on feel, just based on interactions. Yeah. How can you teach something like that? Right. So what we do is because that doesn't doesn't come naturally to people with autism. We break all of these social behaviors down into concrete rules and steps that a person with autism can easily understand. Okay. And we don't just provide the lesson though, we have to actually demonstrate what the skill looks like. Right. So we do role play demonstrations where we demonstrate what to do, but we also show what not to do. Okay. The, the not to do is important because that's the common social error that a person with autism might make. That's, is there negative feedback when they see the what not to do? I mean, they're watching a role play or being part of a role play. They actually love the bad role plays because <laughs> okay. they're funny and they're yeah. kind of over the top. But interestingly enough, those are the common mistakes that they often make. And so um, not a lot of negative reactions to that, more a lot of positive. They really enjoy that piece. But, you know, it's not enough just to do the role play. Right. They have to actually have an opportunity to practice, right? right? That's really key. So in the session, they always practice whatever skills they just learned, not the bad examples, yeah. just the good. Yeah. And then in order to make sure that the skills generalize to other settings outside of our group, we give homework assignments. Okay. I know one of the things we know from the research is that um, these social skills programs don't tend to generalize to other settings, don't tend to be as effective. But the homework is where you actually get them to practice in the real world. And that's also where the parent coaching piece comes into play. And I imagine, again, the importance of the parent knowing what's going on in the program, being a part of the program, not simply uh, taking a look at the homework. We have a question already from our audience. The autism spectrum is really broad. Who is this program geared towards specifically? Great question. So the autism spectrum is rather broad. Um, we actually have developed this program for kids with autism that are of average to above average intelligence. All of our research is focused on kids with IQs above 70, so kids without intellectual disabilities. Okay. Yeah. So we've already got the questions coming in. A reminder to those of you who, um, who haven't, submit your questions through the Ask a Question box, and we're going to try to get you um, some answers. Um, rules. Doesn't sound like, uh, I mean, you know, kind of scary. You're dealing with young people, generally mm -hmm. don't like rules. Um, mm -hmm. Why does this work, and, and how do you know that it does? Well, it's interesting. A lot of people might not like rules, but people with autism love rules. Okay. Yeah, they tend to love rules because they're, um, they tend to be thinking very concretely and very literally. And so they often see the world in, in terms of rules. In fact, they often gravitate towards things like math and science yep. because everything's very rule-driven. You always know what you're going to get. What the right answer is. In That's the right. It's predictable. And a lot of autism really relates to predictability. And the social world is not very predictable. Right. And so we try to to make it as predictable as possible so they love these rules they're very very rule rule driven and so the way that we teach the curriculum is that we break everything down into kind of do's and don'ts of social behavior so the do's essentially are what you're supposed to do and now those are basically what we call ecologically valid social skills and that's the technical term technical big term, very but. big term but technically what it really means though is what people who are socially successful are naturally doing. Right. That's what we want to do. Okay, we also have don'ts. Now the don'ts are based on the common social errors that people with autism make. Right. And so we establish a curriculum around these do's and don'ts. Right. So what our father might have told us uh, would not have been ecologically valid. It's just what they said. <laughs> and so we're trying, well maybe or maybe not, and what we're trying to do is go to the data so that we can provide those skills. Another question, I find it hard for my son with Asperger's to understand what a good friend is. Mm. He often calls someone his best friend if they give him something or right. make a, a good gesture. Right. So we spend a lot of time as a whole session just focusing on um, appropriate choices in friends and, and finding appropriate friends. And we talk about the differences in types of friendships. There's sort of like casual friends or acquaintances even. Right. Um, there's regular friends, there's best friends. We talk about the different types. And then we also talk about how friendship is a choice. You know, do I get to be friends with everyone? No. Does right. everyone get to be friends with me? No. And it's okay. There's good choices and there's bad choices. 
is. And so we get into the characteristics of good friendships quite a bit. And we also talk about how you can tell if someone is your, your friend. And that is an issue that a lot of people with autism struggle with. So imagine I'm trying to become friends with someone. How can I tell if they want to be friends with me? Well, they probably seek me out. They invite me to get-togethers and parties. They accept my invitations when I invite them to things. They text me. They call me. They sit with me at lunch. They seek me out. Right. And how can I tell if they don't accept me? Pretty much the opposite of all of that. Yeah. So we try to break things down into very concrete behaviors that are um, easy for our kids to, to understand and manage. Great. Well, I think we're going to get into some of that behavior now. Yeah. Um, so this is the part of the uh, event today that's going to be a little bit different for those of you who've been here before. We are going to be playing some role play videos and we're going to be asking you some questions. Those questions will appear in the slide window. And actually, for the first time, I'm going to be asked some questions as well to see how, how, how I react. Um, and we're going to go through them. Now, this is very similar to the way the Peers program operates with the role plays and what not to do and what and what mm -hmm. to do. So at this point, I am very cautiously going to be handing over controls oh, now, Doctor Lagerson, and you can take us through some of these some of these activities. Okay, so one of the skills that we talked about um, teaching in peers relates to conversational skills. So right. before I even get into some of the rules that we teach related to that, I want to ask you and, and maybe the audience a question: What do you think are some of the common social errors committed by kids with autism? All right, so we might introduce this with a role play. Okay. All right, so think about this. Let's watch this role play, and this role play is going to be with. Um, Alex and Ben. Okay. And Alex will be the gentleman on the left, and right. Ben is the gentleman on the right. I want you to watch this role play and think about what Alex on the left here is doing wrong. Okay. Hey, Ben, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good. I just got back from the comic book convention. Oh, last no night. way? Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was downtown, and everyone was there. We all oh, dressed really up. Went, I yeah, I wore the coolest outfit. I met, uh, you know, all the famous authors. It was awesome. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Dude. it was really cool. Everyone was dressing up. And I think I'm going to go next week also. Uh, but I'm not sure what I'm going to wear because I don't want to wear the same thing, but maybe I'll get a new one. I should probably well, go on eBay or something to buy that. Um, but everyone was wearing the coolest costumes. I got a ton of pictures, so maybe I'll get some good ideas yeah, there. Yeah. I think there's one also the weekend after. I'm going to try and go to that too, oh. just get a bunch of autographs, well, maybe. meet a bunch of people. So we'll see. Yeah, a lot of my friends want to go, so I figure I'll just go with them. Yeah. It's a bit of a drive, but you know, it's so worth it because it's a really big comic uh, convention. But yeah, so it'll be fun. I really can't wait for it. Okay, so what did Alex do wrong? Well, I think Alex dominated that conversation quite a bit. Might have been a bit of a conversation hog. Um, our audience here uh, says that he certainly wasn't listening at all. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was, he was doing a, a great deal of talking. That's right, and actually the, the term that you used was conversation hog. That's actually the term that we use in our program. Oh, perfect. Alex was being a conversation hog. He wasn't letting Ben talk. Right. This is a very common social error for people on the autism spectrum. They get really excited about their interests and they want to talk about them, but they end up having very one-sided conversations. It's kind of like they're monologuing or yeah. lecturing to the other person, and they're not picking up on the cues that the other person maybe isn't interested anymore, maybe is a little bit bored, yeah. and so this is a very common social error so we present this role play as an example of what not to do essentially on that note someone mentioned it as well here that they miss some body language cues are there key sort of body language cues that the that you should teach uh, the child to look for? Definitely. You know, a lot of times with social skills, we think that these are just sort of innate, sort of their, their hardwired right. sort of senses that we have. And a lot of people, when you ask, how can you tell if someone wants to talk to you, they'll say, well, it's just a feeling that you get. It's actually more than a feeling. There's, there are feelings associated, but it's right. more than that. There's behaviors. So the first thing is, if someone's interested in talking to me, what are they doing with their eyes? We're look at, looking at you. They're right? looking at you, right? Um, what are they doing with their body? Facing you. Facing you, right. And they're actually talking to you. So those are the three behaviors that we're looking for. Are right. they looking at me? Are they facing me? Are they talking to me? And in that case, what was happening? Did it seem like Ben wanted to talk to Alex? Not at all. Not at all. So now we want to get into the perspective taking, the social cognition that we referred to earlier. What do you think that that was like for Ben? Yeah, I mean, that wasn't very fun for Ben. No. Uh, it was awkward, likely, for mm -hmm. Ben, and I would imagine somewhat frustrating. Yeah, absolutely, and probably boring, too. Yeah, he didn't get well. a chance to say anything. Right. So what do you think that Ben thinks of Alex? Um, he probably thinks that Alex is um, selfish or yeah. self-important. Um, certainly doesn't think he's a very good listener. 
Um, yeah, things yeah. like that. And do you think he's going to want to talk to him again? Absolutely not. Probably not. And this is the common error that our kids make that really makes it difficult for them to make and keep friends. Now, that's just one of many errors, unfortunately, right. for our kids. I want to watch this next role play. Okay. And I want you to oops, think about um, what is Alex doing wrong this time? Sure. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Oh, I'm doing good. It, it, it's actually you're doing well. Uh, well's an adverb and good's an adjective. And, and in this situation, you actually want to use uh, an adverb well. Okay. Well, sorry. I'm doing well. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's for, your, it's for you, so, yeah. Okay. So what did you do this weekend? Uh, I went and played some basketball. So what did Alex do wrong this time? Well, um, this time, um, looking to our audience for a reminder, guys, we want your, your, your feedback uh, as well on that. Um, uh, I mean, Alex, um, once again, is, uh, is not, reading the, not reading the play with, uh, with, with Ben when it, when it comes to this. That's right. So he basically corrected, corrected his, uh, grammar, Ben's grammar. Right. Exactly. So this is probably not going to be a good way to win friends, no. right? And in fact, in peers, we, we call this policing. Okay. Um, because basically there's, there's a common tendency among people with autism to, to notice rule violations. Remember we said they're very rule-driven, right. Yeah. right? They like rules. And when they see that a rule is being broken, many times they feel compelled to point out the rule violation. Right. But the problem is that this is, again, going to be very uncomfortable for the other person. Yes. So we call this policing. And one of the rules for having a good conversation is you don't want to police other people, particularly if that's your goal to sort of make and keep friends. Right. So we have to think about, too, the perspective of, of Ben in this situation. Yeah. What was that like for Ben when Alex was policing him? Well, it would be a little bit embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Probably felt yeah. that he was being quite rude. I mean, this is not specific to uh, people on the spectrum where ASD, a lot of people do this, and it comes across quite rude. Yeah, so he thinks that, that Alex is basically rude. Yeah. Um, anything else that he might think about Alex? Um, that he thinks that he's smarter, more intelligent, That's better right. than. Like kind of a know-it-all, basically. Know -it -all, yeah. And is he going to want to talk to him again? Once again, I don't think he is. Probably not, no. I'm going to look to our, our, our audience right now, getting a lot, a lot, of, a lot of similar things. Um, not listening to ideas, um, probably not thinking, um, well, thinking before he speaks. But, but a question about this, it's got to be, a, is this a tough one to break? It's a tough, because it is rules-based, and, and we're question. using rules to help train or teach them. I think these last two role plays that we saw are very tough to break. Okay. Um, the conversation hogging and the policing, they're very common social errors. Um, if we were just to establish a rule in our peers group, yeah. um, that's not going to be enough to get rid of that behavior. Right. This is where the parent coaching really comes into play. What's interesting about individuals with autism is that if you show them a role play of sort of what not to do, right. they can very easily tell you what that person is doing wrong. But when they themselves are actually breaking that rule, they don't notice that. And so they need to be taught that in the moment. It's sort of like a coachable moment or a yeah. teachable moment where parents can actually provide that feedback when it's actually occurring. Um, something that was coming through as well was the issue around criticism. That sometimes parents find it hard to give Mm -hmm. their uh, their child criticism because they don't react well to it. Mm -hmm. You know, a teaching moment, a coachable moment is quite mm -hmm. different from criticism. But criticism has to be part of it, right? Right. Any well, suggestions there? we don't think of it as criticism. Okay. We think of it as coaching. And right. But the common mistake that parents will often make when they're giving their kids feedback is that they'll kind of lecture to them. Okay. Um, and they'll actually go on and on trying to explain the rationale for why they shouldn't do something. But what do kids really hear when we're lecturing to them and going on and on? I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. I'm there doing it hearing that they're hearing the criticism and also they might kind of check out yeah. I always think of the um, the peanuts cartoon Charlie Brown yeah. right what do all the adults sound like murr, 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 murr. yeah exactly because they check out after yeah. a while so instead we're going to be much more succinct in our coaching we're not going to have it um, be critical we're just going to use the, the buzzwords essentially that we created in peers which are you know let's be careful not to be a conversation hog let's be careful not to police right. and kind of get in and out with the coaching and so parents are taught coaching uh, techniques as part of the program That's as well Right, absolutely. So parents actually meet every week concurrently um, with their teens in separate rooms learning how to be good social coaches to their kids. Okay. All right, so let's look at one more sure. common conversational error that people on the autism spectrum make. And this is an example, another bad example. So watch this and think about what Alex is doing wrong sure. this time. Hey, Ben, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to my mom and stepdad's. They're having a party. Oh, your stepdad's? Are, are your parents divorced? Um, yeah. Oh, when did that happen? Um, when I was 12. Oh, why? Um, well, I don't know. I don't, 
Can we talk about something else? You're 12. Was that was that hard on you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Did they did they tell you why, or you just don't know? Um, I don't, can we can we talk about something else? Oh, I'm just I'm just curious. You know, is it weird like going to your mom's and dad? I'm just curious. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do you like? See one of them more than the other? Or do they like get jealous? Is it weird? Um, I don't know. No. Do they, they like fight over you still? Is it, is it awkward there? Okay, so yeah. what did Alex do wrong this time? <clears throat> well, I was certainly the most awkward of them. Um, yeah. Got pretty personal with those questions and That's was right. really driving, just didn't read the play and continued to ask more and more and more personal questions. Exactly. He got really, really personal. And yeah. another, it's another common social error that you see in autism is that individuals, often because they have poor social cognition, they don't read the cues, as you point out. They don't realize that the other person is uncomfortable. They'll either ask really, really personal questions um, or they maybe share really personal information. And, you know, if you're very close to a person, you're best friends with someone, it's okay to get a little bit more personal. Yeah. So the rule that we have in peers is that you don't want to get too personal at first. Okay. You really need to get to know the person a little bit better before you go a little bit deeper and get more personal. Somewhat nuanced. Is that um, a challenging uh, skill to teach? Or It can be, and that's yeah. why we talk about the different types of friendships. But again, this is where the parent social coaching really comes into play, is that parents can help their kids to really navigate that and know when is it the right time in a friendship to be getting a little bit more personal. Let's see what our audience is, uh, is thinking. They, yep, same things we were saying. Pressing for an answer did not respect the um, other gentleman's um, answers. Um, over the line of comfort, certainly, I felt a little uncomfortable even watching yeah. that piece. They're right. good actors, those kids. Well, thank you. They're our research assistants. I think they do a great job. For sure. So, yeah, so thinking about what that was like for Alex, very uncomfortable. That's yeah. the most common thing that we hear. Um, what do you think that, that, that Ben actually um, thought of Alex? Um, well, he probably thought that there was a weirdness there to the yeah. way it was going on, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, that whole not listening, selfish, mm -hmm. um, you know, not feeling that he's not listening to what he's feeling or what he's thinking. Yeah, a lot of kids will say that. They'll say um, that he was nosy yeah. and also insensitive. It seems insensitive that he's not picking up on the social cues that maybe Ben doesn't want to talk about this. Right. Do you think he's going to want to talk to him again? Once again, I do not think so. Probably not. So this is just a little glimpse of some of the, the skills that we teach around conversational right. skills. Um, there's many, many more, of course, sure. but those are that's a little glimpse of, of what we have. So if we're going to have friends and we're going to have conversations, um, a lot of it comes up to starting that process, yeah. uh, starting conversations or introducing yourself or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. Um, so um, I know that that's part of it. So mm -hmm. how do we go about dealing with that? Well, so that's, you're talking about starting individual conversations, right. which is very, very important. Before we get into the steps, actually, for, um, for how we do that, I want to ask you and the, the audience again another question, and that is, what do you think that adults will often tell kids to do to, to meet new people, to start conversations? Um, simple one, you know, the one that my dad would have told me is walk up, introduce yourself, right. um, you know, tell them about yourself or just introduce you and shake their hand and, and say hello. Yeah, and that's basically what we hear from a lot of our kids. They're typically told to go up and, and say hi or go up and introduce themselves. Right. But if you actually step back and you think about what that would look like, that might be kind of weird, yeah. right? Imagine I just walk up to you and I say hi or I say hi, I'm Liz, and sometimes they're even told to shake hands. Right. Okay, this is not, again, ecologically valid. It's right. one of those examples of where we maybe go wrong in our social coaching. Um, again, before we get to the steps for how you start a conversation, what do you think a person with autism might do to start a conversation with someone? Um, well, probably, yeah, since we've already seen some of the issues, I would mm -hmm. guess a little bit of that monologuing, like yeah. maybe telling two, not just their name, but what their interests are, what they like, what they what they did this weekend, they, you know, things like that. Exactly, right. Yeah. So they're probably going to talk about whatever is of interest to themselves with little regard to whether or not that's interesting to the other person. Right. And it might seem kind of random or off topic. So the way that we introduce this to our kids is we, again, start with a role play, and we're very clear if this is a good or a bad example. In this case, this is a bad example. So we would say, watch this role play and think about what um, Alex is doing wrong in starting this conversation. Okay. Hey, did you go to the uh, comic book convention last night? Or what? The comic book convention. Um, there? I'm watching the game. Um, but you, but did you go there last night? Uh, no, no. Oh, but, I was there. It was awesome. You should have been. Do you, do you like com comic books? Um, uh, yeah, I do. Um, but well, I'm watching. Why did you go there? You should have been. It was everyone was there. Game right now. Oh, yeah. So are you going next week? 
kind of like, I don't know. Oh, um, it's going to be really good. You should definitely check it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what did Alex do wrong in starting that conversation? Well, it was all about him mm -hmm. talking about himself um, and didn't clearly didn't recognize that uh, Ben was uh, doing something when he walked out to him. He interrupted something that he was doing. That's and right. didn't recognize that. Do you think that Ben wanted to talk to Alex? I Definitely after the way Alex came up to him, he did not want to talk to yeah. him, um, certainly. Right, so we talked about those three behaviors that we can look for. How could you sort of tell that Ben didn't want to talk to Alex? Um, whatever was on his phone, I think it was a game, was mm -hmm. uh, where his focus was. Yeah, so he was, wasn't looking at him. Right, he right? didn't turn his body at all towards him and right. really want, it really much felt like he was getting the cold shoulder wanting him to go away. Exactly, so he wasn't looking at him, he wasn't facing him, and he wasn't talking to him. Right. All right, so let's take on the perspective of Ben in this situation. What was that like for Ben? That would have been um, probably a little annoying. Um, yeah. He had just been interrupted um, from doing something. Um, uh, eventually awkward because, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't seem like he wanted to tell him to go away or to be too forthright about it, but clearly that's what his in intentions were. Right. What do you think he thought of Alex? Um, he probably thought Alex was a little weird in the way that he came up to him. Yeah. Uh, why is this guy talking to me about Comic-Con when I'm sitting here, you know, watching right. a game or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, and again, before you ask, I don't think he would want to talk to him. Again. <laughs> okay, you know where we're going with yeah, this. For exactly. Sure. Let's see what our audience had to say about that one and what their feelings were. Um, he thought, get lost. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, and they want to know what the adults in, uh, in Peanuts are like. Uh, you have to watch the cartoon. It's easily accessible. And, yeah, again, no, um, no eye contact, the body language, all of that yeah. was recognized by our audience. Yeah, that's right. And this is, again, one of the common social errors that people on the autism spectrum make and not knowing that this other person really isn't interested in talking to them. So instead of doing that, we actually want to teach them what to do to okay. start conversations. Right. And, by the way, it's not go up and say hi or go up and introduce yourself. Instead, what people naturally do to start conversations is they find some kind of common interest, right? Right. So in this case, Ben was on his phone, his little iPhone. Yeah. Um, that could be a common interest. He was watching the game. That could be a common interest. But you find some kind of common interest and you make a comment or you ask a question or you give a compliment related to that common interest. Right. And then the next part of that is that you're going to trade information back and forth. That's the basically the buzzword that we use for having a good conversation. When you're having a good conversation, it goes back and forth between two people. I tell you a little bit about me. You tell me a little bit about you and we're looking for common interests. Common interests are important because that's the basis or foundation of a friendship. And so we're always looking for common interests. Does that, before we show um, anything else, is that a struggle, even the idea of them finding common interests, or do you, do you find that's an easily, um, an easily learned skill? You know, of course it's going to depend on right. the, the teen or the young adult. Some that comes more naturally than others, sometimes it's a struggle. So we have to teach them additional skills like asking follow-up questions to okay. stay on a certain topic so you're not kind of moving around too much, kind of what I call topic switching. Um, we also teach them to answer their own questions. When I ask you something like, well, what do you like to do on the weekends, and you tell me, I might tell you what I like to do on the weekends and we can try to find common interests. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's definitely something that takes practice to get better at these conversational skills. Okay. All right. So we showed the bad example right. of what not to do. We've established a rule and, and steps to follow for starting an individual conversation. What do you think comes next? Showing them how to do it. That's right. So we're going to show a good example this time. So I would say watch this role play and think about what Alex is doing right this time. Oh, yes. Was it the game? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, what's the score? Um, it's 3-0. There's a minute left. Oh, my gosh, that's crazy. Has it been yeah. an entertaining game? Oh, it's been awesome. Did you see the one last night? No, I don't. I was in the library. I didn't get service. How do you get uh, them on your phone? No, I have this app. It's free. Oh, my gosh, that's so cool. Does it, like, take up a lot of battery? Is it cool? Um, yeah, but, I mean, it's worth it. Oh, oh that's yeah, awesome. Fan. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I got to get one of these so I can watch the game. Oh, it's you should. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay, so what did Alex do right this time? This time, he... Uh, recognized that he was doing something. Mm -hmm. He found common interest or at least asked him about what he was doing, asked mm -hmm. him if it was the game, and then they continued to talk about commonalities about the phones and mm -hmm. the connection and the apps and whatnot. So. Right. So this time, do you think that Ben wanted to talk to him? Certainly looked like he did. Yeah. How could you tell? Well, he actually turned his body at one point. I think he showed him his phone mm -hmm. and was looking at uh, what well, he, he was able to take himself away from the 3 nothing game. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 3 nothing with a minute left. The game's over. But he <laughs> took himself away from the 3-minute, uh, from the 
from the game and actually made eye contact with him a couple of times as well. Right, and he was talking to him as well. Right. So these are good signs. So what do you think that was like for Ben? I think that was a good experience for Ben. Yeah. Well, he might have met a new friend. Maybe. It's a common so what, interest anyways. What does he think of Alex at this point? Um, I think he probably thinks that Alex is someone who's like him. Mm -hmm. Probably thinks that Alex is someone that he can ha has common interest with, can share a conversation. Yeah, with, nice you know. guy, interesting. Yeah. Do you think he'd want to talk to him again? This time I will say yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, got some comments coming in about all of this, but um, a lot of people, um, you know, are, are referencing the fact that there was sort of the ideas exchange going on. There was a back and forth conversation, which was unique of all of the bad examples that, mm -hmm. that we've seen. Um, and he made it about the other person, not about himself. So great, um, uh, great comments. Some questions, though, about this. You're showing people are questioning. You know, it's easy for us to to, to um, you know get these skills, but how easy is it for for mm -hmm. kids with autism? I guess they're seeing that in, in in stuff that they've tried. It's been harder for them to acquire mm -hmm. the skills. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about that. And at the same time, another question that came in is, um, do you find that some of them are not motivated mm. to learn these skills? Good question. So let me answer that one first. Sure. So one of the really critical ingredients for our program is that you actually want to only include kids who, who want to be there. Okay. Could you imagine including an adolescent in a social skills group that didn't want to be there? What would that be like? I mean, I don't even personally think that that's ethical to really force social skills onto someone if they don't want them. Right. That's really a choice. Um, but assuming that they are motivated, it can be very, very um, rewarding and, and enhancing to, to learn these skills. If you don't want to learn them, though, what ends up happening is that you'll get adolescents in your group that have sort of a bad attitude. I call it too cool for school yep. sometimes. Um, they don't think they need these skills. And it can actually create a really negative contagion. So I don't recommend, actually, that we include kids in these groups that don't want to be there. They really have to be socially motivated. And that can be a challenge for families and parents who know that their kids need these right. skills, but they don't um, want to learn them. That's so, are there suggestions there that you might have for parents, how yeah. to get them motivated about this? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I recommend is that it, at least the parent can be educated about these things. You know, we were saying that sometimes ad, uh, adults give advice, but it's not always the right advice. Right. So we can at least educate ourselves um, on what are the good social skills so that when we are providing that social coaching that we can actually provide good social coaching. Parents are going to coach no matter what, right. whether the kids like it or not, yeah. but let's make sure that we're actually giving good advice. So that's one thing that parents can do. Okay. Can I go a couple more questions if that's okay? Mm -hmm. um, a uh, question about maintaining friends. We haven't, we've been talking about um, getting friends. My son has two to three core friends that we have been fostering for the last couple of years. There are many times that he'll wander, to him, uh, wander by himself at recess, and when his friends ask him to hang out, he says that he wants his own time or alone time. Mm -hmm. He may do this several recesses in a row. I worry socially that his friends will forget about him and that the friendships will diminish. Mm. So one of the ways that, that kids develop close, meaningful friendships with their peers is by having get-togethers for adolescents and adults or right. playdates for younger kids. Now, the playground activity is definitely important, and it would probably be useful to really help that child um, really understand the perspectives of those playmates and how that might make them feel in that situation. What was that like for them when you said, I don't want to play with you? Um, what are they going to think of you? Well, maybe you're not interested. Are they going to ask you to play again? Well, maybe not. Right. Maybe they might give up. But if he does need his alone time, that is something that he could potentially explain. But then foster and nurture those friendships through having play dates or get togethers outside of school. Um, do you find that um, people with autism are generally curious about others? Like, you know, we're, we're asking them to, mm -hmm. you know, to think about others, ask questions about, about others. Mm -hmm. Is curiosity a prerequisite for friendship? I think uh, for many people on the autism spectrum, they are very curious about okay. other people and almost mystified, really, by how the whole social world. And so at least the, the families that we work with, and again, these are socially motivated kids, um, they're eager to learn the sort of decode their social landscape, so to speak, and right. understand their social world. I think it's a very confusing and perplexing place for many people with autism. And, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, we talk about social motivation.
motivation. But the reality is that it's not that most people with autism don't want to have friends. Right. They're not necessarily asocial. Most of the time they want to have friends, they just don't know how to. Right. Or they've had some of those negative experiences, yeah. which I think I think you've got coming up next and we do need to talk about is mm -hmm bullying and teasing and how to how to deal with you're out there trying to start a conversations trying to meet mm -hmm. new people trying to maintain friends in high school elementary school mm -hmm. it can be it can be quite challenging so um, how do you guys deal with teasing bullying and things of that nature in the program well we definitely focus on bullying towards the latter part of the intervention it's a really important component we talk about different types of bullying and okay. one type of bullying is verbal bullying or teasing right. and this is a really common issue that that all kids really struggle with yep. it, you know it's not just kids with autism that get teased in fact it doesn't really matter um, how popular you are every kid gets teased yep. it's how you react to it that determines determines how sig significantly or severely how chronically you're teased. And before I get into this, the strategies that we use, I want to yeah. ask another one of these questions to sure. you and to the audience because this is a really good example of where we often give the wrong advice yeah. around teasing. So what do you think that most adults tell kids to do when they're being teased? Uh, walk away. Yep. Um, don't pay attention. Tell your teacher, mm -hmm. tell an adult. Absolutely. Those are basically the three um, th bits of advice that they're given. They're told to either ignore the person, right. um, to walk away, or to tell an adult. And then, you know, I, I ask every group of kids that I work with that question. They give the same responses, and then I ask them, does it work? And, and what do you think they say? The answer is probably no. No, it doesn't work. Got a good one here, too. Kids are even told not just to ignore it, but don't let it get to you. Don't let it get to you. Yeah, yeah. of course it's going to get to you. It's upsetting right. to be teased, but you can't show that you're you're upset. So let's okay. let's talk about the what those different strategies might actually look like in reality. So we're told to ignore, walk away, tell an adult. Yeah. Imagine that you you were teasing me. Yep. Okay. I'm sure that would never happen. No, I would never tease. Never. But imagine you were teasing me and I just ignored you. What would you do? Probably keep teasing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You'd keep teasing me, and I kind of look weak in the process. Yeah. Are you more likely or less likely to tease? me again. More likely. To more likely, again. exactly. Yeah. Okay, what if I walk away? What do you do? Follow you and tease you some more. That's right. You're going to follow yeah. me. You're going to tease me some more. Because I'm looking for a reaction when I'm teasing, right? And just being yeah. quiet, I'm just going to push until I get something out of you. Right? Definitely. So again, in this whole process of walking away, I'm looking weak again. Yeah. And are you more likely or less likely to tease me? More likely. More likely. And what if I tell an adult? I will, there will be repercussions for that. My teasing <laughs> will, will really amp up, I think. As yeah, a because you're going to want to retaliate against me because right. I just tried to get you in trouble. Correct. So again, I'm making it worse for myself. So these are not ecologically valid strategies for handling teasing, and yet for probably generations, we've been telling kids to do this very thing. Yeah. Now before we again get into the skill of what we teach in peers, what do you think a kid with autism would do in response to teasing? Um, well, they maybe have an emotional response yeah. um, that could be anger or maybe get upset by it. Definitely. That's yeah. what we find very often is that they get really upset, maybe get sad or angry. Um, but what kind of reaction is the teaser trying to get out of us? They're trying to get the biggest reaction they possibly can, I imagine. Absolutely. So we're doing exactly what they want us to do. Are we more likely or less likely to get teased if we get upset? More likely to get more teased. More likely, exactly. Got another parent here that says to te that they tell them to say that wasn't a very nice thing to say. Mm -hmm. Is that something that works? Well, you tell me. If you were teasing me and I said, that's not a very nice thing to say, are you going to say, oh, Liz, I'm sorry. You're right. That wasn't very nice for me to yeah, say I'd that. Yeah, I'd probably keep going. Probably keep probably, going. Right, because I'm still giving you a reaction. That's probably going to be fun for you. Right. All right, so probably not the best strategy. Instead, what we want to do is teach an ecologically valid strategy, and this is what we teach our kids to do in our program. Now, this is what kids who are socially successful naturally do. They give a short comeback that shows that what the person said didn't really bother them. And in fact, what they said, it was kind of lame, right? Yeah. Kind of stupid. So they'll say things like, you know, whatever or yeah and, or and your point is, or am I supposed to care, is that supposed to be funny? What do you think they do with their eyes? They roll them. They roll them, right? What do they do with their shoulders? They shrug them. They shrug them, right? right? And that's giving the impression that what the person said didn't really bother you. If I were to say whatever to your you know, teasing, would that be fun for you? 
um, no. No, in fact, a lot of people say it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. So again, this makes it less likely that you're going to get teased. So you actually practice the whole Valley Girl thing in, <laughs> in, in the peer program. Yeah, absolutely. We actually live in the Valley, interestingly so enough, in sense. LA. But yeah, but you, can, you don't have to live in the Valley to do the Valley Girl thing. It, you know, it depends, though. I mean, not everyone sounds like a Valley Girl right, when they do this. In fact, there's some gender differences there. Right. A lot of boys, for example, will sound kind of bored or indifferent. So they yeah. might say, you know, whatever. Whereas girls might have a little bit more attitude. You know, say like whatever and kind of be having a little bit more dramatic flair, I suppose. Yeah. Now, we haven't gotten to a lot of the data yet today. And there's probably people out there, parents, and we're seeing it right now who, who you know, are saying like that this might be a challenging thing for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for their children. Do you find that this is something that is easily learned within the program? Is this a struggle for uh, for the kids? Interestingly enough, this is one of the skills that they master the most quickly of all of wow. the skills. Um, because it's not really that complicated, is it, to say whatever or yeah and. Yeah. Um, so actually, no. And what's also interesting about this session is that, you know, it's teasing. It's, it's peer rejection. It seems like it would be so emotionally charged. But we don't focus on what it feels like to be teased or bullied. We focus on what they can do in these situations to make it less likely right. that they're teased or bullied. So interestingly, this is the session where we have the most laughter probably in the group because the kids learn the skills very quickly, they master them, and I think they feel very empowered and right. in control. Great. So I have another role play for All you. Right. I want to show you an example of what this is supposed to look like. So this is, again, Alex and Ben. Um, but I want you to watch in this role play. This is Alex is going to be teasing Ben. Okay. And I want you to think about what Ben is doing right in handling this teasing. Hey, Dweeb, reading again? Whatever. Why are you reading? You're the biggest loser in school. Everyone says it. Am I supposed to care? Probably should, because you're a loser. Don't you want to change that? Anyway. Okay, so what did Ben do right? Well, clearly he used some of the buzzwords that he was taught in mm -hmm. the program, but, I mean, he let it roll off his shoulder. He acted mm -hmm. like it was silly what the guy was saying and kind of annoying and mm -hmm. he just brushed it off. That's right. And did he eventually walk away? Yeah, sorry. He, he did. Away. That's right. And that's the thing too is that we don't have to stand there and take it. After a few comebacks, then you can walk away, but you never want to walk away before right. you've given the impression that what they said didn't bother you. Now, bullying does take two forms though. Mm -hmm. And we're talking right now about words and that, but there's, there's some more intense levels mm -hmm. of bullying. Are there, do you discuss strategies when it comes to that as well? Definitely. You know, a lot of people lump bullying behaviors into one big category, right. bullying. But there's actually very distinct types of bullying. And really through research we've discovered there's four types essentially. Okay. Um, that was the verbal bullying. So that's sort of the teasing. There's also physical bullying. What do you think physical bullying would be? Hitting, punching. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. It can also include um, less, less serious things like um, maybe tripping someone in the hallway, right. throwing little bits of paper at yep. someone or even putting a note on someone's back, that's physical. Um, there's also electronic bullying, what we more commonly refer to as cyber bullying. Right. And then there's also relational bullying. Relational bullying involves rumors and gossip and also social exclusion. You know, we're not friends with you anymore. So who do you think in, engages in more of that relational bullying? You mean like age or? Uh, gender, girls gender. or boys. Uh, Rumors, gossip. Oh, girls. It's a girl thing, right? right. It's, it's typically the mean girl sort of bullying. Yep. But those are all types of bullying, and the strategies for each type are completely different. Okay. I mean, if someone were um, tripping you in the hallway or shoving you into your locker, would it make sense to say whatever? No. Not at all. So the strategies are completely different. Okay, and you guys go through all the strategies? We won't go through all of the strategies. Okay, within the program. Okay, so um, as we move on, we're getting a lot of questions here. Um, one of the questions that came in is, uh, what if my child really wants to make friends, but because he's had a hard time in the past, is constantly rejected by his or her peers in their high school? And I imagine if you go through the program af after you've been with a, a mm -hmm. whole group of kids for a very long time, elementary school, middle school, mm -hmm. whatever, um, that it can't be easy to come back with all these new skills and all of a sudden just make friends. Yeah, exactly. So very, very common issue that comes up. Um, we talked about those two categories of kids, the peer rejected versus the socially neglected. Right. This is a description of a peer rejected kid. Um, maybe at one point was actively seeking out his peers and, and now getting pushed away. May even have a bad reputation amongst his peers. Yeah. And so in that case, what we do is we want them to engage with peers that are going to be accepting 
typically what we'll do is we'll work on changing their reputation in the school setting. Yeah. But meanwhile, part of that involves kind of laying low and not drawing attention to yourself, not really engaging your peers while your reputation is dying down. But meanwhile, we want to find them a source of friends outside of the school setting. Right. So that might be enrolling them in extracurricular activities in the community based on their common interests with other people and making friends that way. While they're doing that, finding friends in the community that don't know about their reputation that haven't been rejecting in the past, we're going to work on changing that reputation in the school. And the, basically the way that's done is you lay low for several months, right? You, you fly under the radar, yeah. essentially. You hope people forget all about you. And while you're doing that, you're kind of following the social norms. You're not being a conversation hog. You're not policing other people. And then what you do is you do something kind of dramatic and you want to get the attention back on you. So this is where you might change your look in some sort of way that has people notice you, essentially. Now, what happens then is you know you get a new haircut, new clothes, people are going to notice, especially teenagers. Right. And they're going to come up, and do you think they're going to start asking you about your whole new look and everything? Clearly. Definitely. Well, this is where the backhanded compliments start to fly. Right. So they'll say, oh, yeah, you look really good and everything, but you used to dress funny or you used to be weird. You used to, like, you know, tell everybody their business or whatever it was that you had a bad reputation about. They're going to call you out on that. What do you think the natural reaction would be to do if someone's, you know, insulting you and calling you names and saying that you used to do something they didn't like? Uh, well, have an emotional reaction, justify, defend. Defensive, right? People right. get really defensive and they say, no, no, I wasn't like that. You just didn't know me. Well, if you do that, you don't get to change your reputation because right. they're going to think it's the same old you with like a new haircut and new clothes. Instead, the next step is you own up to your previous reputation. You say, yeah, I know people thought that about me, but I'm kind of different now. And then at this point, we might have an opportunity to actually find an accepting peer group and friends. What do you think about just switching schools? That's the most common thing that parents will do is that they want to switch the schools because they think that that's going to help their kid Fresh escape. Start. They think a fresh start. But what could happen with that, that reputation? It probably but could follow if it's the school is just across the street. Or exactly. The road, right? It could follow them. It could follow them because kids in the new school, no kids in the old school. Right. Or, so the grapevine. Or they could just continue to do the things that got them the bad reputation in the first place. So changing schools isn't always going to be a recipe for changing a reputation. So one thing that we haven't brought up, but um, it's got to be part of all of this, is the um, fact that you, you've got young adults in your programs mm -hmm. and dating has to be a part of the discussion in some capacity as well, yeah. starting conversations with the opposite sex and things of that nature. Do you touch mm -hmm. on that in the program at all? We do that in our young adult program, okay. yes. I actually spent a year of doing focus groups with families about treatment priorities. I was thinking about including that in the adolescent program. Didn't work out. Parents didn't really want to go there. Okay. Teens wanted to go there actually, but parents didn't. But we do include it in our young adult program and we teach skills related to dating etiquette, things like how you let someone know that you like them, how you flourish essentially wow. how you ask someone on a date um, as well as just kind of general dating do's and don'ts yeah yeah okay so um, we have got about 10 minutes left we want to get to a bunch of these questions but before we do it is really important we have set off the top that this is an evidence-based program and so we want to talk a little bit about where you can find the research and where you can find the data and what it all really means so um, to start off with um, Talk to us a little bit about um, the data that you've got here. It's for uh, assistance for teens and adults. This is out of the UCLA program? Yes, this is the UCLA um, peers program, some of the data that's come out of our lab. And we've had a number of studies that we've done with adolescents and adults on the autism spectrum with really great um, significant findings, okay. change in, in, in terms of social skills. Um, and usually we see a lot of these changes in areas like social communication, conversational skills. Social motivation also tends to improve, as well as things like social awareness, and social cognition, being able to take on the perspectives of others, picking up on social cues. Yeah. Um, additionally, we see um, really nice improvements in social engagement. Our kids are having more get-togethers with their friends. Our adults are more socially engaged. Um, and they're also experiencing less loneliness and isolation as a result of the treatment. Um, but this research has also been replicated in, in other settings as well. So we like have... other parts of the world? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have um, colleagues, for example, um, at Marquette University has probably done the most research outside of UCLA. Um, colleagues in South Korea, you mentioned other parts okay. of the world. Um, Dr. Hee Jong Yu at Seoul National University um, did a really beautiful cross cultural validation trial using peers um, in South Korea. And what she did was she first translated the manual, okay. which is no easy task. Um, then she actually shared that manual with mental health professionals and asked, you know, where are the cultural sensitivities? Yeah. And she adapted based on that. Then she went into the schools and she actually surveyed over 400 kids. Wow. 
wow. typically developing kids around some of these ecologically valid skills, like how you handle teasing, for yeah. example. She developed a curriculum around that and then tested it and found it was just as effective as the work that we've done in the U.S. and, and Canada. Uh, so for those out there, we have a lot of professionals that are on, are on the line. For those out there, where can they find this information? If maybe they're skeptical about what we're saying or mm -hmm. just in general want to want to get the data. Yeah, so um, you absolutely can um, access these articles on our website, okay. the UCLA Peers Clinic website, yeah. um, as well as our Facebook page. We put all of these articles up so that families can access them. So they're welcome to do that. Been very popular, been very successful. We've said that a bunch of times. Take us through some of the data points that lead to that to that, um, that belief that it's been such a success? Well, we take a number of behavioral um, measures to make sure that what we're doing is actually working. I think you can't really um, emphasize enough the importance of evidence base. You know, a lot of people have social skills programs out in the community, but they, that doesn't mean they're necessarily effective. So that's been a big part of what we've done. And so, as I mentioned, we see lots of improvements around social skills in right. general. We actually also see decreases in things like problem behaviors. Even autistic symptoms tend to go down from a severe range to a more mild, moderate range as a result of treatment. And in some of our long-term follow-up studies, we actually have found even greater improvements over time. So, for like example, once they're out of the program. Yeah, which okay. is really a kind of unheard of. In right. fact, most of the time, the research suggests that um, maybe people might improve a little bit from pre- to post-test, like right yeah. before like, and after the intervention, there's some improvement, right. but that goes away right. after even weeks or months. Um, so we wanted to look at the, the sort of the, the, the sustainability or the durability of our findings over time. So so what we did was we actually conducted a one to five year follow up assessment of our families um, after they left our program. Yeah. And what we did was the, the teens were about 17 at the time of follow up. It was one to five years later. Average time to follow up was about two and a half years. That's okay. a pretty significant amount of time. And what we found was this really beautiful maintenance in treatment gains. So if you take a look at the slide, T1 is always going to represent that first testing time, that pretest. Exactly. And the T2 will always be the post-test immediately after treatment. T3 is what we're really interested in. That's the one to five year follow-up. So what we see here is this really nice improvement in just yeah. general social skills over time. We kind of take our kids from a low average range to a more average range of social functioning. Almost too good to be true, especially when you know the data with a, you know, usually programs there's a spike and a little bit of a drop off. Yeah. Why different here? I think truly the power behind this program is the parents. We're not even going to take credit for it because the program continues on long after they've left the peers group. The peers group is a time limited group. It's 14, right. maybe 16 weeks in length, not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things, but parents stick around and they continue to socially coach their kids and so they continue to be the interventionist essentially. So I think that's the true power behind this program. When we also look at other areas of social skills, like problem behaviors, those also decrease over time after the going through the peers program. That's not the normal social trajectory that you see in autism, and yet that's what we see in our program. If you look at the subscales of this particular measure, this is the social skills rating system. It's kind of like the gold standard of assessing social skills. What I want to point out here is blue here represents uh, the pretest. Right. Red is the post-test, and green is that one to five year follow-up. Everything is moving in the right direction, things like cooperation, assertiveness, empathy, self-control, they're all going up and internalizing, externalizing, going down. That's what you want to see. Right. If you also look at even just an autism screening questionnaire, this is the social responsiveness scale. And this is because it's an autism screening questionnaire. High scores are bad. Right. Low scores are better. And look at this. We see this really nice decrease in autism symptoms from that pre to post test as well as one to five years later. We've taken our kids essentially from a severe range right. of autism symptoms to a more mild, moderate range of autism symptoms. We're not curing autism. Right. And I don't even like that language, to be honest with you. But we're definitely seeing this really nice improvement in autism symptoms. Same thing if you look at the subscales, everything is moving in the right direction. We're seeing greater social awareness and cognition, better social communication and motivation, even autistic mannerisms. Everything is improving over time. Another just really important thing to mention, too, is it's not just sort of how we assess social skills and social responsiveness, but are our teens and our young adults, are they engaged with right. their peers? That's kind of important. Right. So what we find here in this next slide is that um, this is a kind of parent and teen report. Parent is the blue, red is the, the teen report. And what you find is that when kids come into our program, they're typically having about two get-togethers a month. Okay. Okay. Can you even think, what do you think the average teenager has in terms of number of get-togethers? 
get togethers in a week. Yeah, I would imagine that it's got to be four or five, like almost Very every good. day. They're yeah, trying. good guess. Right around four is okay. pretty typical for a just typically developing kid. And our kids were having only two yeah. um, per month. So when we have them leave the program, we also have them identify how many get-togethers they've had. And additionally, they would have maybe about four, maybe five get-togethers a month um, after leaving the program. One of the um, things that we look at one to five years later is, are they still having get-togethers? Right. And we find that they're having about four get-togethers per month. What's great about that is that when they leave our program, we give them suggestions, things that they might do moving forward. And one of the suggestions is that they should try to have a get-together at least once a week. And okay. guess what they're doing? Once a week, that's the number. Once a week, that's right. Then finally, one of the things we wanted to look at in this study is we also wanted to look at, well, did the kids learn the skills that we were teaching them? Yeah. And did they remember them? And what we find is that they actually do remember the skills for the most part, even one to five years after going through the treatment. And again, I attribute all of this to the parent involvement in the program. So that we've seen some stuff on uh, just tons of feedback. <laughs> you know, it's uh, actually kind of hard to, to follow it all at one point, but you know, we've had some people that say this, this stuff has got to be hard for kids with ASD mm -hmm. to, to, to learn. The data shows you otherwise. Go to the website. Go to the Facebook page. We're going to put it up at the end. And it's all, um, it's all there, all the data that supports these findings uh, for you to get um, educated about. Um, we're getting right down to the end. We've got a bunch of things to cover. I want to keep answering your questions. Um, does it come up at all? They're trying to go out and make friends. Mm -hmm. They have some success. And then right away the parents recognize these aren't the right friends, like mm -hmm. this is bad influences. Do you deal with that at all in the program? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about that early on in the program about choosing appropriate friends. Right. And sometimes our kids don't make appropriate choices. Like, For example, many of them try to become friends with the bully, right? Okay. The kid who's teasing them or bullying them. Why do you think they try to make friends with the bully, by the way? I don't know. I mean, I, that's not just, I mean, you see that with a lot of kids, right? Yeah. They think that the bully is the stronger or the mm -hmm. cool, the alpha male. Yeah, and a lot of times they think, too, if they become friends with the bully, then they won't bully oh, them. Right. Self, right? Self-preservation. Exactly, but it doesn't tend to work out very well. They usually don't make friends with the bully, or if the bully does make friends with them, maybe they're just, you know, manipulating them, exploiting them in some way, and All continue right. to bully them. So we do talk a lot about good choices and bad choices, and that friendship is a choice. We don't have to be friends with everyone. Right. Not everyone has to be friends with us. What about strategies for parents who, um, ki kids are in, like, middle school already, and they don't know a lot of the parents of the friends or the supposed mm -hmm. friends, and they, they seem to be having um, troubles arranging play dates with their schoolmates? Mm -hmm. So play dates are basically um, social um, activities among younger children, so okay. probably primary but school But even if it was something kids. that they wanted to get to know the other kids yeah. and whatever. So in terms of in involving other parents, yeah. um, I think that that's a, a strategy that becomes more important in primary school than in secondary school. For many of the families that we work with, um, many of them, if their kids are having get-togethers as teenagers, the parents are organizing those get-togethers. But the reality is, who really is supposed to organize get-togethers in adolescence? Is it the parent of the, the, the it's teenager? It's the kids. It's the kids, right? Yeah. But very often, parents um, feel stuck, because if they don't organize these get-togethers, then they'll say that their teens won't have them. Yeah. So, And if you ask them why they won't have them, they'll say, well, they don't know how to. Right. So instead of relying on parents to organize these things, we teach kids how to organize their own get-togethers. How do We talk about the four W's, how you figure out who's going to be there, what you're going to do, when it's going to happen, where, how you're going to get there. Right. Um, we teach them strategies for organizing their own get-togethers with parent support. It's kind of like parents are behind the scenes, kind of yeah. helping, but it's still Coaching. really coaching, exactly. Um, but the idea is that this is really, we have to teach our kids to do this because it's not very appropriate, developmentally appropriate for parents to be doing these things once kids hit secondary school. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say at this point, because we're at the uh, end of the program, that we've done our job because the most commonly asked question here is where to get this program in Ontario. And for that answer, you go to the place where you go to get most of your information as it relates to autism and ASD, and that is the Autism Ontario website. Go there and it will talk a lot about where to access the program within Ontario. That's for all you folks in Hamilton, Burlington, the GTA, everyone who's asking those very, those very similar questions. But the information is widely accessible. Right? Yeah, one of the things I'm really passionate about in my work is not only developing and testing these interventions, but to make sure that they're accessible right. to people. Um, you know, that's not always the case with, with evidence-based treatments that you can access them. So we've been very focused on developing treatment manuals and even a parent book. Um, so that families can access these programs. And so we do have a published manual for mental health professionals that want to run these parent-assisted programs. Yeah. It's called the Pierce Treatment Manual. Um, we also have a school-based curriculum that's uh, meant for educators.
educators, essentially anyone working in the school setting that wants to develop this program in an educational environment. We have this curriculum for school-based professionals. We know it's not always possible to include parents, so we have really comprehensive parent handouts with that manual to send home to parents. Okay. And then we also have a parent book um, called The Science of Making Friends, and this is really focused on teaching all of the skills that we teach in peers to families that might not be able to access a peers program in their community. Books, uh, links to buy the books or links of where to get the books you can find in the resource section. But, a lot, you know, role plays and a lot of what you do, that's based in video. Mm -hmm. Do you have DVDs that go with the books? How we do, do. Okay. yeah. So the Science of Making Friends actually comes with a DVD companion. Um, the role plays that you saw today, those all come from that DVD. Right. Um, and they're meant to be watched between with te teens and their parents or young adults and their parents and, and talked about much in the way that we just talked about them. Right. They're also um, part of a, an app that we recently developed called Friend Maker. Okay. And and FriendMaker um, is actually an app that describes the entire curriculum really in an outline form, all of the skills that we teach, and has embedded videos okay. of all of the skills that we teach in peers. And it's basically designed for um, instances where it's not appropriate for your parent to be there right. or not appropriate for your teacher to be coaching you, but you still need a little additional uh, assistance right. in social coaching. This is a virtual coach, essentially. Incredible. Well, um, Autism Ontario is, um, many of you know, Autism Ontario released a paper called Social Matters, and, it, and in, this, uh, in this book or this white paper, it talks about the importance of evidence-based um, uh, training such as the Peers Program, which is why we, we're so excited to have you on the desk today and very supportive of it. Something that we want all of the professionals that are out there um, right now to know about is some upcoming training sessions that are made available, are going to be available to you. There should be on the screen right now, and it's March 4th to 6th, 2015. Here's information about it. This is where you'll go through the actual training yourself and be in a position to help um, all of these parents that are coming through and all the people that are looking where to get the, um, the training in Ontario. So please reference this. You can contact Autism Ontario to get more information. All the information is up there on the screen. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. Is there any parting words you want to leave with our audience? Well, it's just, it's been a great pleasure, and I, I would love to thank Autism Ontario again. They've really been a leader in bringing evidence-based treatments to Ontario, and they were the first to bring peers to Ontario. So it's a pleasure to be back with Autism Ontario, and I look forward to this training coming up in March. Okay. So, again, all the time that we have today, any questions that weren't answered, we're going to aspire to get those answers to you. On the screen are some more links. Make sure before you leave that you access the Resource Center for information on the books, the websites, the data that will was discussed today. As a reminder, this presentation in its entirety will be archived on the Autism Ontario website early next week. Tell your friends, family, or anyone that you think might be interested that that's where they can go to get it. And you yourself, if you want to review some of the content, come on back and watch, and watch, and watch the replay. Um, for Dr. Loggison, Autism Ontario, and myself, we want to thank you so much, not only for being here today, but for being so participatory in today's discussion. It really made things move along quickly. And we'll see you next time at an Autism Ontario event.